Thanks for tuning in to the Medivac podcast powered by the Robert Irvine Foundation, whose mission is to support and strengthen the physical and mental well-being of our nation's heroes and their families. I'm one of your hosts, David Reed. And I'm your other host, Christian Myers. Thank you very much for joining us today on the Medivac podcast. If you're new here, there's a price for the show. You have to share it with a friend or family member if you get something out of today's episode. And with our guest, he's got a plethora of experience, both in the military, life experience, and beyond. Uh, he is one of the, unbeknownst to him, inspirations behind the Medivac podcast. Mm. When we, uh, when Dave and I were ideating the uh, the story for Medivac podcast, we used Chief Master Sergeant Jeremy Hardy's story of rescuing General Goldfein and how we would want to display that. Uh, so thank mm. you for being an inspiration to the show, brother. Yeah, uh, thanks for being here. Thank this, you so much for having me. So, interestingly so enough, honored. yeah, we've had, we've had this conversation for, I mean, years now at this yeah. point of having Goldfein on. So we're, we're excited that that is a potential. Yeah. And we're excited to hear the story of from the rescue perspective. So thanks for being on. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, Jeremy, but, you were a, Bottom line, it was just, you know, being in the right place at the right time and being yeah. uh, prepared. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you spent over 20 years in the Air Force as a yeah. pararescue man. 25. 25 yeah. years 25 in the Air Force. years. Yes, sir. Yeah, wow. becoming a Chief Master Sergeant of, well, you were the 720th. Uh, yeah, that was right? um, uh, my, my culmination Chief. was Chief of Battlefield Airmen Weapons and Tactics. But yeah, uh, yeah I was the 720th Group Chief for man. a while. But uh, yeah. So, so impressive, man, to like become at the absolute top of Air Force Special Warfare. It's. It's pretty cool. So we're excited to hear a story today, man. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So from the top, we're going to rewind it all the way back and ask our favorite question to really kick it off is what what inspired you to join? Uh, how did you hear about PJs? Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you have a history of family service? What was it? Yeah. So, um, you know, my dad was a medic in Vietnam, mm-hmm. um, but we weren't a quote unquote, and, and my grandfather was uh, a tank driver in World War II. Wow. But my we grandpa were, did the same thing, yeah. tank driver. So the, 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 the beautiful story about my grandfather is, so he's on the French front. Mm-hmm. His tank gets hit by a bomb, gets blown up, yeah. gets blown up, um, goes to the hospital, meets his nurse. And the, he says, I'm going to get, when the war is over, I'm going to come back and marry you. <laughs> so he goes back to the front. He gets blown up again, goes back to the hospital in England, Damn. has the same nurse, and Married her and brought her home. Made her a war bride. Wow. Yeah, it's, wow. A, it's a really cool story. I feel like that is a classic World War II story. It, yeah. Isn't it? What, really? what country? <clears throat> so he was on the French front, but uh, the hospital was in England. So in England. L- so, Liverpool, okay. yeah, yeah. So actually my aunt, my great aunt, I guess, um, dated Paul McCartney before the Beatles got famous. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Said he was a dickhead, but I'm, can I say that? I'm, oh, yeah, yeah, you're allowed to. <laughs> so, no rules. <laughs> uh, said he was a dickhead, but uh, anyways. Um, so, I, but, but, but my family didn't necessarily promote uh, military mm. philosophy, okay. you know. Um, in fact, the only time I've ever seen my dad cry was at my pararescue school graduation. Because wow. he said, I know what you're going to see. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, but um, when I was, uh, I, was in, I was in a youth program called Civil Air Patrol when I was Oh, a kid. yeah. I was in the same program. Yeah. CAP. Yeah. yeah I, was, I was a CAP <laughs> cadet. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was a spots cadet. Mm. Uh, but um, when I was 13 or 14, I can't remember, um, I went to this camp uh, that CAP. Uh, uh, did that was the pararescue orientation course okay down at Fort Knox mm. right so <clears throat> I'm 14 years old I meet this guy named Scott Gearin and this guy had um, a parachute malfunction so his parachute opened and he, and, and he looked up to see if his, if his parachute was open and another skydiver came through his chute oh shit crushed every bone in his head his chute collapsed yeah he fell 3,000 feet to the ground, mm-hmm. right? A bunch of PJs landed right next to him, saved his life. 18 months later, this guy's jumping again. Wow. Like he's back on status. So um, I met him when I was 14. He was he was um, volunteering while he was still recovering, right? He was volunteered for this uh, pararescue orientation camp. And I'm like, that's, that's the dude I want to be. Yeah. Like I want to grow up to be like that guy. Mm-hmm. You know, and the really cool part is uh, when my first duty assignment was a 23rd Special Tactics Squadron, 
And my first supervisor was Senior Master Sergeant Scott Guerin. <laughs> mm. so I, How cool is that? Right? Yeah. He, he, didn't, so he, he didn't enjoy the story as much as I did, but, yeah. you know. So that's how I decided. I'm like, you know, I always knew I wanted to go in the military. I always knew I wanted to do special ops. Um, but the whole concept of saving lives, mm. you know, uh, I, I'm a Christian man and, and I, you know, I follow those uh, principles. And so here I could do all the cool stuff and I get to save people, yeah. mm. you know? Yeah. And so that's how I, that's how I ended up becoming a PJ. Yeah. That's mm. amazing. That's a cool story of inspiration, especially being able to work with, you know, the person who inspired you yeah. to join in the first to, place. To this day. So th there's a, a friend of ours, um, his name is Donovan Chapman. Okay. Um, he was a PJ. Um, now he's a country music singer. Hmm. I think he's number 13 on Spotify or whatever. But yeah. so, you know, he's, you know, he's got his, Up but, he, but yeah. he wrote a song about Scott and, and when Scotty, you know, fell. Hmm. And then he wrote a song about me, which goes into maybe some of the other things you want to talk about. But, uh, his song about me talks about, um, you know, saving the general and my homelessness and then the general coming back. And yeah. it's just, it's, it's an amazing song. Yeah. Uh, I'm just so gifted that, um, I have these people in my life. Yeah, absolutely. What's yeah. the name of the song? Um, Did you off the top of your head or? Yeah, it's, uh, the, the me that I brought home. Me that I brought home. And is this like on Spotify or where, where's yeah, this? The, the, it's on so Spotify. So we should definitely share the link yeah, to yeah, the song be. if you're okay with that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That'd yeah. be great. That's, That's very great. cool, man. Mm -hmm. It's it's funny you mentioned that because you have that, you know, you and Dave are both in CAP, but I was actually inspired in a similar way uh, to be a part of Rescue. When I was a kid, uh, I was probably in fourth or fifth grade. One of the helicopters from our local guard unit, one of the H-60s came out and landed to talk about uh, counter drugs. So the DARE yeah. program, not doing drugs. They land the helicopter there so they could talk to kids about, you know, getting your life straight, that kind of thing. And the crew that landed when I was a kid at our, our elementary school, I ended up doing counter drug with uh, later in my military nice. career. So it's, nice. it's funny to did, be able did, to did work with Did they have the people. M2 or, you know, did they have oh, the yeah. mini gun? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome, sometimes, brother. Yeah, sometimes that's awesome. We would, we'd keep the guns on. Yeah. They always thought the probe was, you know. A missile. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, right, right, right. But yeah, until no, you see one break off, break off, and during in flight, yeah, know? then it becomes a missile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's very cool, man. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Now I was yeah, just yeah. gonna say, let's. Uh, I, I really want to kind of touch base on the training that you go through when sure. you are pursuing being a PJ. Yeah. Um, you know, every branch of service. My, my son just reported to Paris Island. Mm -hmm. For Marine Corps boot camp last oh, week. Oh, amazing. Right. Very cool. And I'm really proud of that. He wants to he, be a MARSOC. He went Marine Corps as opposed to following his father's yeah, footsteps. Yeah. So uh, that was his choice mm -hmm. to, you know, go Air Force, be a PJ, or, you know, his mother was a Marine and, mm -hmm. you know, he thought MARSOC was, you know, his path and, and I support it. Yeah. And uh, absolutely support it. Um, he's having a tough week for sure. <laughs> dude, he's getting his butt kicked. Yeah, yeah. I bet. So his yeah, birthday was last week, and I couldn't call him and wish him a happy birthday because oh, he's getting his ass kicked by a yeah. bunch of DIs <laughs> right now. <laughs> At least you can laugh about it, though. Yeah. 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 So, um, so every branch of service has what they consider their elite, mm -hmm. you know, the best of the best. Um, the real difference, I think, is when you talk to those guys, especially at the tier one level, and ask them, you know, who are the most kind of capable and most um, flexible and they can do everything at, at any time. Mm -hmm. They'll always roll back to Air Force Special Tactics, which is your combat controllers and your pararescue. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we don't do very many missions unilaterally. We always are attached to another Special Forces team. Um, but the training, it's two years. At, if, if everything lines up right, mm -hmm. it's of two course, years. Of course, of course, <laughs> at best. Yeah. Right, you know, so. If you go all the way through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, obviously there's a 12, 12 weeks of indoctrination, um, which is just getting your ass kicked. Mm -hmm. You know, can you survive this? Then we'll let you go forward kind of thing. And then you got jump school and survival school and halo, you know, uh, high altitude, low opening, free fall school. Mm. Um, you get dive school. You get all these schools. And then you get to the Pararescue University in Albuquerque. And then that's a good eight to ten months. Yeah. Um, 
you know, every pararescueman uh, maintains a, a civilian paramedic rating, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So if you're a civilian and you want to be a paramedic, it's two years of school. We do it in four months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very condensed. Yeah, Yeah, very accelerated. I remember driving around Albuquerque with all these index cards taped all over my car (laughs) with like medications and doses, you know, just trying to memorize this stuff. Jam packed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And then, you know, we got mountain phase and tactics phase and, and, uh, and then they kind of wrap it up at the end. But, um, you don't get a day off. Like, um, yeah. You know, I, I, I'm not, um, and I got a big ego, but I'm I'm willing to admit that every single day that I woke up in the pipeline, I wanted to quit. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I was freaking tired. I was sore. Yeah. I was yeah. You're like, can I get through one more day? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. So that's that's kind of how. It what works are some out. of the most challenging moments that you found yourself in? Hmm. A thousand push-ups because I uh, left a carabiner uh, unclipped. Oh, that no. was that was a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that, but it's a lesson that you learned. Yeah, and yeah, been I, I've in never your... left a carabiner unclipped since. <laughs> <Not> once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, now, honestly, it was uh, it was a self battle. Mm. Like the hardest part of going through that training was battling with yourself. Mm-hmm. It's not quick because we all we all like comfort. Yeah. Right. And yeah. there's nothing comfortable about becoming. You know, whether it's a SEAL or a Ranger or a Green Beret or a PJ or a controller or whatever, it just, there's nothing comfortable about getting there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, you got to just get comfortable being uncomfortable, man. It, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, for us, we lose most of our people in the pool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Drowning them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, not necessarily, yeah. but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so I remember one morning. I woke up and, you know, when you hold your breath and you start getting that urge to want to breathe, Mm -hmm. like that hurt. I woke up one morning, I'm like, you know, and I meditated and I wasn't, you know, I meditate now, but I didn't meditate back then. Yeah. Looking back, I realized I was, but um, I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm going to enjoy this feeling. Yeah. I'm going to enjoy what it feels like to crave oxygen, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that got me through the pool segments, just... Right. You and force and so, yourself to believe that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and I have taken that into my life now that things that suck, mm-hmm. like I just like, I freaking crave that this sucks. Yeah. Yeah. So because you know that. what it's going to do for you. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. That, uh, that pool section, uh, gets a lot of people. <laughs> it does. It's yeah, a lot it does. of, a lot of people. What would you say the washout rate is for that? Uh, I, I all right. So our, the last study, and again, I've been retired since 2015, so these are going to be skewed a little yeah. bit. But um, when I retired, we had an 85% washout rate overall. Mm-hmm. Um, of that washout rate, 93% was in the pool. Wow. Yeah. That is incredible. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to get comfortable <laughs> under the water if you're not a water guy. And so, well, and the not whole thing, so we got this 50-meter pool and this, this big dome over it. Um, you know, uh, air inflated dome. Um, so it was, you know, we could be in the pool 365 and you could hear the instructors drive up and you would just be sitting there on the pool side, just rocking, knowing you're just about to get effed up. You know, (laughs) you know, cause it wasn't just holding your breath. You'd like, you'd be swimming and they'd be throwing, you know, like throwing fins at you, just just making life uncomfortable because, Mm -hmm. you know, honestly, um, most of, not most, at least easily half of the missions that I've accomplished have been in the water. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, I did a mission in the Philippines, and I remember I'm, I'm pulling this guy up out of the water, and as I pull up, a shark, like, breaks the surface. <laughs> right. Oh, man. Right. Like, just right there, because the, the you know, the reverberations of the helicopter hovering and, yeah, yeah. and whatnot. But, um, um, yeah, uh, my very first mission was in the water. Mm-hmm. You know, I was still in training. Okay. Yeah. And a couple of yeah, 15. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, uh, Greg Rackley, he was the commander of the 85th Test Squadron mm-hmm. in, uh, at uh, Eglin Air Force Base. Him and his um, DO were out doing a uh, 1v1. So they were fighting each air, you know, doing a combat. Aerial, yeah. Yeah, aerial combat with yeah. each other. Well, they clipped wings and they both ejected. Mm. Uh, F-15s, right? Yeah, two F-15s. 
And um, I was in initial familiarization training for special tactics. Okay. And so um, the chief walks in, and um, I was supposed to get a check right. I was supposed to get a, an evaluation. Mm-hmm. And the scenario was a pilot ejects over the water at night. <laughs> oh, just the mic. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> the the pilot ejects over the water at night, and um, you know my job is to go in and get him out. Right? Okay. So the chief walks in, and I you know I showed up early. I'm prepping my gear. I'm you know this is an evaluation, man. I get, you know I got to get this right. <laughs> yeah, you got to get right? yeah. Can't get anything right, wrong. Man. Yeah. yeah. So the chief walks into the team room. He's like, hey, Jeremy, um, how quick can you be ready for a two-pilot rescue over the water? Thinking oh. it's still part of my check ride. I'm yeah. like, I'm ready now, chief. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> right? So then everybody, like everybody in the squadron is like running up, throwing stuff in trucks and, you know, getting all the equipment together. And we drive to the flight line. There's rotors turning. There's people running around <laughs> everywhere. And I look at the chief and I go, man, you guys take your check rides pretty seriously, don't you? And he's like, hey, fuckhead, this is for real. <laughs> 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 and that was my first mission. So That's awesome. went in, we low and slowed into him. Uh, so, you know, 10 feet, uh, 10 knots over the water. I jumped on the water. Yeah. You know, got the guy, whatever. To this day, we're still friends. Yeah. That's so, awesome, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What a great time to get that your was, first that's, rescue, too. I, that's where I popped my chair. Yeah. yeah that's and he didn't even one, realize right? it. Yeah. yeah. Didn't even realize I did get a Q1, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it kept it in evaluation. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Complete. Yeah. yeah. Good for another year. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. So uh, so you started off as special tactics then instead of instead of a, a rescue unit? Yeah. So my, my first three years, I was a crew chief on cool. F-15s. Okay. Um, and another funny story, I lost one jet hmm. over the water, engine failure. All right. And uh, what... Uh, um, this uh, this man Ken Fournier was the PJ that rescued the pilot. Yeah, who went on to become my mountain phase instructor. Who, like a couple of years ago, went on. We met at a movie set. We were both in a movie together. Yeah, and he was there. So How funny. Um, but yeah, so started my first three years as a, as a crew chief. Um, so when I went through indoctrination the first time, um, our six mile eval, which was a week before graduation. I tore iliotibial band tendon in my knee. Uh, oh man, yeah, mm-hmm. that's devastating. How'd you do it? Uh, running, just running, just just like yeah. It's always it's, the silliest things, you know. It's yeah. nothing, nev- nothing ever cool like j- <laughs> jumping up. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, it's and like, like I picked running. up a pencil and threw my back out. Right, you know? exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just knees too hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so when I tore the tendon uh, at that time. Um, so this is 1990, and uh, it's good it was military airlift command, right? Um, so the Air Force had a rule: if you're going to get special duty pay, the career field has to be below 83 percent Manning, mm. right? And yeah. pararescue was at 84 percent Manning, so they weren't taking like they weren't taking setbacks. Sure, like we're not going to set you back. Hey, thanks for trying. Yeah. They made me a crew chief. I thought it'd be cool to have my name on a jet. Uh, it was a sucky three years, but yeah. then I went right back and, and got back into it and spent the next uh, 22 years as a pararescueman. Mm. That's incredible. That's, what, is, what are some of the highlights of your career? Minus the mm. big story that we're going to get into. Sure, sure. Um, I think uh, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, uh, interesting. That was oh, amazing. I, I, it was like a pararescue reunion, Yeah, you know? In 14 days, um, the wing, we pulled out 4,307 people wow. off of rooftops. So it was just one of those nonstop. All like, the time. Two and, weeks and, nonstop. And just kicking in doors to look for people. And, yeah. you know, there's uh, one funny story I like to, to share about Katrina was um, we got a story or we got news that there were people stacked like cordwood in attics hmm. um, in, in the... Um, the affluent uh, level uh, by Lake po- uh, Punchatrim. Okay. So I land on the roof, and I think I'm hearing people scream through um, a vent in, in the attic. So the only thing I have on me is a crash, a crash axe, and I start just chopping through this roof. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I finally chop through, I get this huge like rush of gas in my face. 
And then I realized the screaming I'm hearing is from the guy next door saying, don't, don't, don't. Oh. Because the, the water had floated the roof off the foundation and broke the gas lines. And oh. the natural gas lines were bowing up into the attic. And so now I've got like a freaking bomb underneath me. He's right underneath you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and you're so, hacking away with a metal object at this. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So I obviously, or, sorry. So I obviously stopped that. Yeah. Um, uh, but then I've got a freaking hoist cable coming down. Yeah, which right. static electricity. Static mm-hmm. electricity is going to spark. So I'm running around this pitch roof trying to catch this freaking <laughs> hoist cable so it doesn't spark on the roof and blow us, you know, blow us to bits. Oh, but, man. Uh, but yeah, 4,307 people we pulled off the rooftops. It was amazing. That's an insane. It was awesome. Of people. That yeah. is, that's got to be like just a memorable, memorable. It was fun. couple of yeah. weeks. Do you have I mean, and we were flying, you know, 14 hour sorties with yeah. crew, crew, uh, crew rest waivers. And yeah, well, the hurricanes are no joke. I mean, yeah, that's, that's 24 hour operations for the yeah. most part. Did you have anyone shooting at you in Katrina? Um, so the only time, so we did have people shooting at the helicopters. Yeah. Right. Um, the only time that I witnessed anything like that, um, I hoisted on this really small, um, balcony, just maybe twice the size of your table here. Okay. You know, very small. And um, I was looking for uh, one of the other ladies that we'd rescued said there's a 92 year old lady in, you know, uh, in this corner apartment. Mm. So I ho- hoisted down on her balcony and I went in. And as I'm walking in, um, this guy steps out with a knife. And I can't understand what he's saying. It's like, hibbity, jibbity, hit Vietnam, how about Biden? But he's coming at me. Oof. And so, you know, I got my headlamp and, you know, and, and so I put my hand on my pistol and I'm like, sir, you know, I'm Air Force Rescue. We're here to rescue, you know, and he takes a step forward. So I pull my pistol up. I'm like, sir, please stop. Yeah. yeah. So then I walk back out onto the balcony and now the helicopter's got its spotlight down. It sees me. <laughs> out on the balcony with my pistol out. Oh, shit. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And yeah. then he just dove in the water and swam away. What? Yeah. So, <laughs> Never so, to be seen again? No, so so, <laughs> so this is the second floor, right? So this is the second floor. First floor is completely Fucking underwater. Rambo that you just encountered. He just freaking dove in the water and swam away, and, and that was it. What? Yeah. <laughs> so, that is... I mean... Yeah. Yeah, like, what do you, you say encounter. after that? You're just like, I mean, that what was, can you say? Like, that was I, weird. I mean, I've got the pilot screaming in my headset. What is, what's going on? What's going on? What's yeah. going on? Shut up. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got <laughs> yeah. it. Leave me and alone. Then, and then, you know, he goes away. And so I put my pistol back in. I found the 84 year old or 94 year old lady. Hmm. And then she didn't want to, um, she want to go. There was this huge freaking H60 hovering right over her apartment. Yeah. Right. And uh, she's like, well, if God wants me to die, then, uh, you know, I guess I'm going to die. Like, God sent me here, dude. And that's what I said to her. <laughs> yeah. I sat down on the couch next to her and said, well, maybe God just sent me. Yeah. yeah. And um, then the worst experiences of PJ happened. So I put her on, you know, I put her in the horse collar. Mm hmm. Uh, and we're hoisting her up, and uh, you know, old lady, old ninety-two-year-old lady, not wearing panties and a skirt, oh, no. and I'm watching her hoist up. So, <laughs> oh, God's gift to you. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no pleasure goes unpaid. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. But that got her to move, though. Yeah. Huh? Did. She did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean that makes sense. That's good bedside manner, like in an. I was on Danny Deutsch. I don't know if you guys know who that is, but he's like, so I was on Danny Deutsch um, and a cup and Miss Mississippi and Miss Louisiana. So we did this interview after that rescue, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, my favorite thing is I've got this picture and then it went on national news and both of the girls had like this surprised look on their face. Because I had my hand on both of their butts just to get the picture taken. <laughs> There's only once you can do that, man. Yeah. You, you, gotta, you gotta take an opportunity. You're only really yeah. allowed one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're getting recognized for yeah. you know rescuing four thousand plus individuals, I think. Yeah. A little butt grab's not bad. That's yeah. fine, right? <laughs> they cancel each other out, I guess. Back to sure. square one. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Back to square one. Yeah. 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 Uh, four thousand people. You touch someone's butt. Uh, <laughs> You're getting canceled. Yeah. yeah. In today's day and age, that's, that's just, yeah, cancels right out. I, yeah, I can sorry. imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I would say Katrina was a, a definite highlight. Yeah. Um, 
uh, combat wise, you know, we'll talk about General Goldfein. I mean, that's obviously, you know, a mission that I was just lucky enough to uh, be a part of that kind of defined my career mm -hmm, from sure. there on out. But um, I mean, at last count, 234 confirmed rescues. Yeah. So every one of them is awesome. Yeah. Every single one. You know, some were easy, some were hard. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's why I became a PJ. Yeah. Just freaking, let's get in there and get them out. You know? Yeah. I lost more people than I saved. And I try not to focus on that. But yeah. Yeah. Kind of that comes with the job, though, right? Yeah. And how, how did you, uh, your first experience losing someone? Mm. How did, uh, were you prepped for that? Did somebody talk to you about it? Did they talk to you after on how to compartmentalize, how to process things? Or was that something you were just left to your own devices? Uh, ultimately left to my own devices. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've gotten way better about it, yeah. it currently. Uh, but at the time, no. I mean, I remember it vividly. Um, and it was like something out of a freaking Hollywood movie. Mm -hmm. You know, tell my mom, like... like as this guy's dying in my arms, I'm doing everything I can, you know, do to save him. Just he wasn't savable. He was he was bleeding out. There's nothing I could do. Yeah. Um, but having a human being die in your arms, like you're cradling, like, like I'm serious, it was like a movie. Yeah. I'm cradling the guy, tell my mom I like you know, like, and um, yeah, you can't get past that. I mean, that's something that just sticks with you. Sticks with you for yeah. life. Yeah. You yeah. can you can get used to it, but you can't overcome it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's it's hard to not feel slightly responsible, right? Without a doubt. What could I have done better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What exactly. didn't I do? Mm -hmm. You know. That's I mean, that's I'm 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 fairly training. fairly confident in, in you know in my skills as a you know, as a pararescueman to save lives, but mm -hmm. um Man, when you lose somebody, you're always going to think, could I have done, mm -hmm. didn't I do this? You know, and like six months later, I'm like, oh my God, what if I had ligated that vessel? Or, you, you know, I mean, it just, it, it sticks with you, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But um, that was the first. Yeah. And there were hundreds after that. Yeah. So it's starting to wear on you at this point. Like, do you, do you feel it like as a burden as you're progressing through your military career? Um, no, honestly... For me, um, I just, I was so busy that I was just in it. Yeah. Right? Until I couldn't be anymore. And so about 2003, so granted, I joined in 90 and, you know, we did stuff pre-9-11, mm -hmm. especially in, you know, um, Europe and, and South America. So, you know, I've been in continuous combat operations since I joined. Yeah. Um. It was about 2003 when I started thinking I wasn't feeling right. Mm -hmm. Things were getting rough. I was drinking more than I should. Yeah. You know, and then about 2006, I like came to the, you know, the realization that I was struggling with PTSD. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I wasn't going to tell anybody because it's going to put me on the bench. I mean, yeah. I've got missions to run. You exactly. Know? Yeah. Was so there, Was there a defining moment that uh, highlighted that for you or was it something, mm -hmm. just a gradual realization? Um, a bit of a gradual realization. So I was, um, I was, uh, attached to SEAL Team 8. We were doing a hit and I placed a breach in charge. It was this assistant breacher. So I placed a breach in charge and a sniper round hit the metal door that we were trying to breach. And, um, you know, obviously the shrapnel went into my face. Mm -hmm. And when I was recovering from that, that's when I realized that, man, like this, like I've dodged so many bullets. Literally. Five IEDs, mm -hmm. two helicopter crashes, got like ricocheted. Like I had a glancing blow from an R RPG-7 on my helmet. Damn. Knocked me out. Obviously it was a dud or I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but when that sniper round blasted my face, and maybe it's just because I'm freaking vain. <laughs> yeah. But, but I was like, all right, man, like seriously, I like this might not be mm. like, you know, but again, I, I, as I mentioned before, I'm a Christian man and uh, I believe that God's got a mission for me and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here mm. if my mission was done. Mm -hmm. Sure. So he had something, it still has something for me to do. Yeah. Just don't know what it is yet. Mm -hmm. 
I'm hoping it's a hot 18 year old girl, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even have a conversation. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. We can uh, have our hopes and dreams, Jeremy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> hopes and dreams. Yeah. Butterflies and rainbows. So <laughs> you saw, you see this, uh, the shrapnel uh, as a realization for you. Mm-hmm. Do you take any action or do you just compartmentalize, move on, get to the next mission? Yeah. So after, after, the, after I got out of the hospital from that mission, I, I did take action and, um, uh, I went to an in residency program for PTSD. Okay, because mm. I just knew that there was no way that what was going on in my head that I could deal with just by myself. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. So, and I had a little bit of help from from, from some friends, but um, and then after that, I went back to work. So, and how was your leadership's response to this? Was it like, okay, you go get yourself right, come back when you're ready? Yeah, it was more of, hey, good for you for recognizing you have a problem Mm -hmm. and getting yourself fixed. Now get the fuck back to work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good because most people, they have the fear that the moment you raise your hand, you're done, right? Right. And like so many other people who who can attest to that, that, that's the case a lot of the times. Yeah. So was there a specific reason why why you were able to come back on to flying in in combat status or operational status? I think it was... um, yeah, honestly, I think it was just my background, like mm-hmm. you know, my track record with yeah. rescue and special tactics. They okay. knew that, you know, they knew I wasn't malingering. Yeah. They knew that I just wanted to hack the mission. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and they wanted to support that. But they also, we were far enough along um, that they understood that uh, in order for that guy to hack the mission, you got to support him. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and you know, there were some family issues with my wife and whatnot that were going on and, 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 uh, you know, there's nothing that leadership can do about that. Yeah. Uh, but they supported me going, you know, I, I mean, a month mm. I was gone for a month and in resident treatment. Yeah. They supported that yeah, and well, visited me yeah. while I was there. And then when I got back, they didn't treat me any different. What was Chief, get back to work. What That's was great. some of the therapies that you went through? Um, and what year was this again? 2006? So th- this would, No, no, no. Um, so 2013 was okay. the first time okay. that, yeah, okay. that I uh, actually had in-resident treatment. Mm. And it was, uh, you know, the same stuff that I do right now with my clients, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, um, you know, talking a lot of stuff through, recogn- recognizing, you know, um, or helping your client recognize, you know, where this comes from. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, it's really, there's, there's not a whole lot of science to it. As a therapist now, I'll tell you, it's, it's kind of easy. You know, your only job is to teach the client how to heal themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, CB, CBT specifically yeah, is really w- good without a doubt. Yeah. yeah, right. Where are your stuck points? What you know? Um, but you know, there are other things that uh, I incorporate now: uh, plant medicines mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that. Um, that are, um, you know, what I would ca- equate to like ten years of therapy in, in a in a six hour session. <laughs> mm-hmm. right? We say the same thing all the time. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it really is. Um, but the bottom line is. Um, PTSD and the sequelae, the the symptoms mm-hmm. um, from TBI, are rampant in our society, right? Yeah, and, and it has been since World War II. I mean, you know, shell shock, yeah. combat fatigue, you know, put whatever name you want on it, but it's yeah. the bottom line. And when you know, as as humans, we're doing something that's not human, mm-hmm. and we're going to freaking pay for it. Yeah, right. And uh, we owe it to our veterans to um, to make sure they're taken care of. Hmm. That's what I'm doing now. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's incredible that your leadership was able to kind of accept that. And and honestly, having that uh, reception back where it's like get back to work is probably what I would want too. I wouldn't want yeah. anyone, you know, kind of. Don't coddle me. Yeah. Don't treat me different. My get, feelings. Yeah. Get it, the it's hell just, back to work. Get, man. get back to work. Good. Yeah. Take care of your shit. Yeah. You're good to go. Get back in it. Right. Don't treat me any different. Yeah. Right. So that must have felt like, okay, I'm good. Like, I'm sure when you were on that plane or, you know, 
taking that drive back to command, you're like, oh, what is everybody going to think of I me? was so embarrassed yeah. the first day you can imagine. I, I walked back into the office. Mm. Yeah. I was so embarrassed because I felt like I was weak. Yeah. Like yeah. I failed. It's understandable. Yeah. And, yeah. and man, everybody, like my subordinates and my leaders were just like, you're good, bro. You're back. Thanks. We're, yeah. we're, we're, we're so glad you're back. Now get your ass back to work because yeah. we have shit to do, you know? That's good. that's good. They treat it like a physical injury, right? Same thing. Yeah, like they, if, they actually, that's a good way yeah. to put it. Yeah. If I hurt my back and I come back, I don't want you to coddle me. The same thing. Like, yeah, my brain was hurt for a little while, but I, I'm better now. I'm in a better place. Okay, let's get back to work. Yeah. Right. Glad to hear you're better. No, I agree. Let's get after Absolutely it. agree. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Did you feel like crystal clear at that point? Were you still like, um, still you found foggy? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, found we, some coping mechanisms, though, that you could deal with? and Yeah, and that's where I learned how to meditate. Mm hmm. Um, got into yoga, um, got into spend a lot of time in the gym to mm. like just have this physical release of, of tension. Um, you know, going through, I mean, you know, all PJs are pretty physical specimens, but, um, I was always a middle of the pack guy mm-hmm. and just, you know, whatever I need to do to get through. Um, but in my recovery, uh, yeah, I really got into exercise. Mm. And like I said, exercise, yoga, therapy, or I mean, uh, um, meditation, um, prayer, you know, all that kind of stuff, um, internalizing the the injuries. And mm. I think that's really important because you have to internalize them. Uh, when you externalize an injury, then you become a victim. When you internalize an injury, you become the, the healer. Mm. And so I just learned how to just internalize this stuff and deal with it in, in those ways. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, applying those skill sets, especially meditation, I, I find that to be so beneficial. Mm-hmm. Whether you're in the military, in a high-stress job, a civilian, it doesn't really matter. It helps you to walk thing, walk yourself through life events that are happening. Is this the appropriate reaction? Did I respond appropriately? Are these relationships beneficial? Am I putting the time into the places that I need to be putting them into? Whatever you're meditating about, I think it's incredibly beneficial. I agree. And, I agree. And I would add that, that, that <clears throat> something else that, that's equally as beneficial is um, writing stuff down. Yeah, journaling. journaling. Mm. Yeah. You know, just getting into your guts and a book that nobody else ever gets to read. Mm-hmm. You just get to vomit stuff on paper. Yeah. Uh, I think that's you know, hugely beneficial as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially for, like, I, I struggle with uh, spinning spinning thoughts. So, mm-hmm. like, especially, like, the night night before, like, if I'm going to bed, I'm thinking about the following day. What do I have to do tomorrow? Right. I have all these check boxes. Well, if I write those down on a piece of paper, like on my journal, and I put check boxes next to them. They're out of my head. They're on the paper. I don't have to think about them anymore. Sure. And tomorrow I get to check the box, physically check the box. And how awesome complete. is it when you get to freaking complete the checklist? Oh, yeah. It's great. Like, yeah, it's a win. So yeah, it is. Right. It, it is. It is. Right. Satisfaction. Yeah, it is coming a huge up on win. four out of five boxes checked. I'm like, oh, <laughs> no I'm matter how done. small it, it is. Day, man. Yeah. Yeah. No, no matter yeah. how small it is. It's, yeah. the, it's the McRaven theory, man. It's it like successfully. Make your bed. That's it. That's it. And if you have to write that down, on it with a checkbox, make my bed, checkbox. Go As a matter of fact, that's checkbox. even better to do. Write yeah. that down. I, I, I love yeah. this concept. And, you know, yeah. something that I, I talk about quite frequently is uh, journal dumping. Mm-hmm. Is uh, don't think about it. Don't worry about your spelling errors. Don't worry about how the text looks. Just write and mm-hmm. continue. And fill out a page. And without even thinking about it, highlight the things that repeat. And that's the things you have to work on. Yeah. Mm. You know, yeah, for, uh, so in 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 uh, in DBT we call it uh, free writing. Mm-hmm. Just just write. Yep, doesn't have to make sense. Yeah, you go back and look at it after and make sense of you know the patterns, like you said, highlighting yeah. the patterns and you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 hugely hugely beneficial. Well, I think that most of these problems are a derivative of not taking the pause and thinking about your day ever. We're well, so, we don't want to. We're right? so just constantly pushed all of this stimulus yeah. at right. every second of the day. We're on the phone when we had, I mean, we don't even take a shit without doom scrolling on Instagram, <laughs> right? Sure. So how, like, of course you're going to have these reoccurring thoughts and these just overwhelming emotions at night because you don't have time to think about it mm. ever during the day. And, and and that's honestly that's um, 
That's purposeful. We do that on purpose so we don't have to yeah. Yeah. think about that stuff. Yeah. And then we lie down and try to go to sleep. And we can't sleep and because this all is, this stuff's going mm-hmm. through. This is the compilation. All the this stuff is we pushed away. The reason why PTS exists, yeah, right? Without doubt. We we do twenty five years of service, and then we're out, and then we have time to think, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And that is a dangerous, dangerous position to be in. And, and and you know, and not just that you have time to think, but you lose your support structure. Yep. You your tribe. Your yep. Yeah. Yeah. Your tribe. Exactly. Your, your identity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Your purpose. You know, Herbert Field, uh, the security forces guys that manned the gates, had a three binder, um, like, had a book, mm-hmm. and that was their visual ID. So when key leaders of the base came to the gate, they would recognize them and go, hey, Chief Hardy, or hey, Mrs. Chief Hardy, which my wife freaking hated that. Uh, but <laughs> anyways, um, and like I went to the base a week after I retired, and they had no idea who I was. I'm like, <laughs> like so a week ago, Chief Hardy, hey, welcome back on base, you know, and now they don't know who I am. Yeah. Uh, and it, you just you lose your tribe that yeah. quick, mm-hmm. without a doubt. And that's tough, man. And if you don't prepare for it, and I don't think, I mean, I went to the executive TAC uh, uh, transition program at the Pentagon, which I think is probably one of the better transition programs. But even they didn't prepare me for going from, you know, hero to zero in a day. <laughs> You yeah. know? I think Good way of putting so, it. So the executive TAPs, that's for 06s and E9s and yes, above, right? It is. What, what do they tell you there that, like, well, you're a chief PJ. Like you're going to find any job that you want, right? Is they that really how they do kind of put it out that way. I think they do a massive disservice because we've talked about this. Obviously, we hire 100 percent veterans at our company. We've talked about like not hiring E9s or O6s and wanting to focus more on like E7s you or should. O4s. My, my, I actually yeah. have a hard rule yeah. about E7s yeah. and above, and and uh, and O6s and above. So, yeah. uh, of not you, hiring you should, them at all. Those guys, <laughs> like. E nines, O six, and above, they'll figure their way out, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's the E fives, the E six, the combat vets, even the E four that's medically retired. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're the guys that need the freaking hand up. Yeah, yeah. really. But they're the you ones know? who are going to like drive and and. Well, they're still used to working. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's you know, minus yeah. special operations, right? Yeah. Those ranks are, are are a little skewed at yeah. this point. Um, but you know, for the most part, you know, you have a uh, just an entourage of individuals as an E9, not an E9, but maybe an 06 and above. Yeah. Um, E9s, you still have everyone to, you know, to delegate to. Sure. So that E6 is still used to like really grinding and proving themselves. Without I doubt. Think. Without doubt. And, and, you know, and honestly, I think if you, you know, so I read in Forbes, I think two months ago, I read an article in Forbes, that the most desired demographic in business was retired senior enlisted special operators Mm -hmm. because we you you have carte blanche you know how to run with the game and you also know how to follow orders yeah you Mm -hmm. know um and you know uh when we have you know when we have fellow veterans who get out before they reach that pinnacle they still have those skill sets they're still there Absolutely. Yeah. Like yeah. you and, and now you but you still can groom them a little bit. Like mm. you're not you're not getting a crusty old chief like me who's set in his ways. <laughs> You've got somebody who's moldable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, but still has that drive, still has that in you know, ingenuity, mm. still knows mm-hmm. to freaking, you know, take the ball and run with it when he needs to or she mm-hmm. needs to. You know, I think it's amazing. I just uh, like veterans are, you know, the military makes Citizens, I, 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 there's no other way I can say it. The you know, makes Starship sense. Troopers, baby, I it love is. that. I, 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 I always think every time someone says that, I never never reference the show because I don't want anyone to know that I'm that big of a nerd. But <laughs> I think you should. You should do two years of service and earn your citizenship so, here, right? So I'm going to out nerd you, and I'm going from the book. Okay, <laughs> from the book. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah, mm. I, you, you know, and. Uh, you know, I'm I, I make no claim on who I'm going to support in the upcoming election, but we've got a candidate that's uh, that's uh, espousing that 
like serve your country, mm. mm -hmm. whether it's in the military or in law enforcement, postal service for Christ's yeah. sakes. Yeah. Serve your community mm -hmm. and then you get yeah. to be a part of the community. How, yeah. How are you going to dictate what happens in the community if you don't understand yeah. how yeah. it's created in yeah. any capacity? Yeah. I mean, it's such a good way to get a plethora of life experience to get out of your hometown, to, you know, get a paycheck, to get some education benefits, sure. to see the world, serve your country, like provide for the rest of the citizens. You know, and, your and even if you, and I don't think we even have tier enlistments anymore, but even if you just did like a tier enlistment, yeah. right? Yeah. You're exposing yourself to so much more of the world mm -hmm. than the little town that you came from yeah. or the, the neighborhood in LA that you came from, whatever. Yeah. And and it's a melting pot. I mean, yeah. it, you know, you, you get pot. rid of stigmas yeah. and stereotypes and every, when you j like join that service, you know, it doesn't yeah. matter where you're from, you come together, you might have a little bit of a butting heads, but at the end of the day, you come together as a team and you mm -hmm. learn to perform as a team. So mm -hmm. when, when I went to basic training, so in, uh, in high school, there was one black person. I came from a very small town in Indiana. Mm -hmm. There was one black guy in my high school. And that was my experience. You yeah. know? And then uh, when I reported for basic training, there was only three white guys in the entire flight. Yeah. Right. Well, so culture shock for and, you. Yeah, yeah. So I remember, you know, you, you get off the bus and the, the TIs are screaming at you or whatever. And I remember this guy behind me going, it's kidding. It's getting, it's getting kind of heavy. It's getting, and I'm like, <laughs> I had no idea what was coming. Yeah. And uh, you know, they ended up calling me Ferris Bueller because apparently in basic I looked like Ferris Bueller. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I don't care if it's 18 months, man. Like yeah. some some sort of service puts you out of the situation you're in and yeah. helps you think outside the box at mm -hmm. the end of the day as well. Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Without a doubt. And you know, it, it's just that it's service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You should give before you get. Yeah, sure. absolutely. And what a good way to do it, too. I mean, it yeah. comes a lot on the back end, so so why not? And I don't care if it's, you know, Salvation Army. My, my girlfriend, yeah. you know, she volunteers at Salvation Army like every other day. Um, You know, just it's service. It's service mm -hmm. to, to, to your fellow man. Yeah. And, you know, and we all know that sometimes it takes rough men to do rough things to mm -hmm. rough people to you know, secure some, some peace. And that's your, you know, that's your piece of the pie of service. And there are people that are just givers yeah. and, uh, you know, Salvation Army, Goodwill, whatever. And then, you know, you also have your first responders, you know, your yeah. paramedics and your firefighters and, and your cops that yeah. are just out there. And they're fighting a war every day. Agreed. Yeah. We deployed. On their home front. Yeah. yeah. Right. We deployed and knew we had a time frame and we were going to come back home. Yep. These mm -hmm. guys do it every freaking day. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's rough when you're doing it in your front yard too. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, that that that's a great point that you bring up too, though. Is that you know when when we say this, the audience has to realize it doesn't mean you have to go to war. No, to yeah. serve, you could Not serve and serve your community community in so many other capacities. Absolutely, but like go do it, yeah. right? I mean, become a better person, become a better <laughs> citizen. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's our calling. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes you feel good. I think innately, it makes you feel good. Without a doubt. Yeah. 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 Without a doubt. I mean, I know I feel good. You know, even when I do something stupid to volunteer with my girlfriend at the Salvation Army, I just saw like, oh, you know, I walk home, my chest all puffed up. I did something good today. <laughs> Got a yeah. sticker that says, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I volunteered. I <laughs> volunteered. And 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 that overshadows twenty five years of risk of my life to save other people. Yeah, you know, instant gratification that goes That's back right. to Ooh. for sure is uh, what can we do in the moment, right? Yeah, to, without doubt, to really, I mean, and and also it is it is a coping mechanism too. It helps, I think. Without yeah. serving yeah. others is a therapy to ourselves, it is. especially those who've served. I, I can't tell you how many times I've just to told or shared my story to people, and I'm like, and the epiphanies I get from that, or the like. You ever you ever give someone a story and you you tell them some advice and you're like maybe I should listen to that too right oh, <laughs> that, I, I call that my my therapy practice <laughs> <laughs> do as I say not as I do yeah. <laughs> it's the podcast of good me. for thee yeah. not yeah. for me yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Pra practice what you preach I suppose yeah. you know yeah it is yeah um, and and that's one of the reasons I love being a therapist now is I'm 
get to you continue to serve. Mm-hmm. It's in a way different capacity. Um, I'd still rather jump out of airplanes and shoot bad guys in the face, but <laughs> it's still a really good way to serve. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and, and you know, all my clients are veterans and first responders. Mm. So I get to serve our tribe. Mm-hmm. It's a great way to stay involved in the community. But and, I don't. And to continue, like, with the service as a pararescue man, you're, <clears throat> you're affecting someone's life in a single point in a single day, typically. But as a therapist, well, now you have the chance to build a relationship with these people and affect change in their lives for years to come. Right. So it's, it's I like, hope so. Yeah, absolutely. And I, 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 I guarantee that's what you're doing. Um, you know, I know you, you're, you're, you're a great guy, and I know you want to serve other people, so... It's it's a very different type of service, but I, I love the approach there. It was it, it just seemed like the natural progression. Um, yeah, you know, I, I I I passed up a couple of opportunities to be, you know, a PA or a nurse practitioner, mm-hmm. um, because when it comes to medicine, the only thing I like is the freaking dirty trauma, yeah. like the just the blood and guts, right? Yeah. And there's no way they can guarantee you that you know if you go into medicine, you're going to stick in that in that area um but i could guarantee as a therapist that i could stick with veterans and first responders Mm -hmm. and so that's what i did yeah yeah Yeah. pick and choose your battles makes sense speaking of so i want to uh i want to dive into your story with uh general goldfein Mm. and kind of tell tell your side of the story obviously you're known for one of the most famous rescues in, in air force history uh, I don't. I, yeah, I wouldn't say famous, but um, yeah, I was uh, within, the, within I go, the community. It is, yeah, I guess. I, yeah. I go back to um, being a prepared guy that was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, very political answer. I like it because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it was. It definitely I, wasn't just me. There was you know, yeah. There was twenty one of us on that rescue. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, yeah. Just. Uh, uh, can you build the scene for us a little bit? What sure. year, so what country I, were you in? I was in Bosnia. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in this plywood shack. So this plywood shack, but we still had a PlayStation <laughs> or Xbox or whatever. We were playing Golden. What year was it? Golden. 99. Okay, 99. Yeah, May okay. 99. Yeah. I was going to say, if it's the first Xbox, then yeah, you're looking at close to 2000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, this was 99. Uh, we were playing 007, mm-hmm. right? There was four of us. You had the four screens. And like, Golden Eye. Yeah, Golden Eye, yeah. 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 You know. <laughs> and then, you know, we've got a satellite radio sitting next to us. Listen, and we get a Mayday call. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, shit. It's, it's time to get after it, right? So we run out to the helicopters because the bird's running. And I can't find my Kevlar helmet or my freaking uh, body armor. Hmm. And For the life of you. No. Which is very odd. It was well because I left it in the rental. I left it in, in, in the car. We'd gone. Uh-huh. We'd driven down the road, and I'm not going to. We visited a place <laughs> run by the Russians that um, had lady friends. Um, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> in Bosnia, yeah. I left my shit in the back of the uh, back of the minivan. Oh no! <laughs> so when the mission comes up, I'm like fuck it, man, just we got to go. Like I don't have time to look for it. Let's just go. And. um Go out, get the road, you know, uh, get the birds running. It was uh, two uh, Pave Low MH-53 helicopters mm. and an MH-60 Pave Hawk mm. from the 55th. Okay. Back in the day. Pave yeah. Hawk. Pave Hawk. Hell yeah. So two Pave Lows and a Pave Hawk. And um, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting for, you know, authority to launch. We finally get authority to launch. We go. And um, so... Uh, I'm in Tuzla, Bosnia, which is right on the border, mm. right, with uh, um, Serbia. As soon as we cross the border, they fucking, they, sorry, oh, uh, they, they push up three surface-to-air missiles. So two SA-6s and an SA-9. And that they, fortunately for us, they were launched ballistically. They didn't have a radar lock on us. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. Right. But the SA-9 went between, so the two fifty threes and the 60s in the back, the 60s in the back, and the missile went between the second 53 and our helicopter. Oh, shit. And I, you know, so you know you know what it's like, Christian, when yeah. you do Viz Recce every year? Yeah, yeah, and I'm like, yeah. yeah, all right, how many of you can tell what an SA-6 looks like in flight? Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> I can tell you. Yeah. I can tell I, you. See the spiral? <laughs> <laughs> so this missile comes right between the two helicopters. And, um, you know, God bless it. It misses us. And then we keep pressing on. And uh, um, there's a, uh, uh, an airplane called J-Star. It's got all kinds of, you know, um, all kinds of radar and and stuff on it to tracks, you know, launches and electronics, yeah. right? And so J Stars gave us um, the coordinates for the general. Well, at times, lieutenant colonel, but yeah, uh, Hammer Three Four was his call sign. Mm-hmm. So they gave us coordinates for Hammer Three Four, but they work on an ellipse, mm-hmm. and so sometimes that ellipse builds in. Um, and you know inaccuracies. Okay. So we found ourselves over this field, getting our shit shot up, just mm-hmm. getting like seven point six to forty millimeter, just getting shot the hell around, circling, looking for this guy, and we were twelve miles away. Oh man! So J Stars updates uh, updates the coordinates. Boom, we go to him. We're flying, and um, we didn't even, we didn't ask permission. Like we're in formation. We got his strobe. We'd already had him on radio. It authenticated him. Whatever. We just broke formation and what, what was the situation that you've heard that he's just encountered at this point? So we knew he was an F-16 pilot, mm-hmm. right? Uh, his, his, he had a siege job, um, enemy suppression of aerial defense, mm-hmm. right? So he was knocking out radar sites and, and all that. And uh, he took an SA-9 um, and it disabled his aircraft. Uh, he was shot down. He, he was shot, like he got hit at 14,900 feet. Wow. And he fought the aircraft down to 3,200 feet before he ejected. Almost 1,500. Yeah, yeah, 15, yeah. It was. Yeah, you can actually go. 1,500 feet? Yeah. You can actually yeah. go, or 3,200 feet AGL was when he ejected. Okay. But wow. you can actually go on YouTube and 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 research Hammer 3 4 shoot down. Mm-hmm. And he has his HUD video and his, like, his voice as he's getting shot down. Mm. And the guy's cool as a cucumber. It's like, all right, guys. Yeah, I just lost my engine. All right, it's all cool. I got it. All right, guys, I'm a glider. I'm about ready, about ready to eject. Uh, start looking for me, guys. And then it cuts. And he ejects. It's oh, just crazy it's to me that at, at 14.9, he's shot down. Yeah. yeah. And like, fought it to, for another 3,200 feet. feet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a lot. And a then he gets on the ground. Me. And, you know, because he fought it down to 3,200 feet, obviously he's going to land pretty close to his airplane. Yeah. And where's the enemy going to start searching? Going to yep. start searching for the crash. The airplane. So they were on his ass the whole time. Mm. I mean, they were on his ass when we picked him up at the, uh, you know, at the landing zone. Mm. And we, we, you know, started trading bullets and bad guys on the landing zone. But, so we, we broke formation and, you know, my one PJ stays next to the helicopter. My combat controller goes out to do far security. I ran out to General Goldfein and... Um, then it felt like uh, somebody started hitting the ground with a sledgehammer around me, hmm. right? I didn't like. I didn't register. Yeah. Right. Bullet impact. And I'm like, where are all these strobe lights coming from in in the tree line? You know, it, like there shouldn't be anybody around here. <laughs> yeah. And then it muzzle, just, it's muzzle like, flashes. Dude, I'm getting my fucking ass shot right now. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. There were muzzle flashes, yeah. and, and the, the sledgehammer were just rounds impacting around us. Oh, so I man. just grabbed him and we ran back to the airplane and. We all jumped on top of them because, you know, we were all supposed to have body armor. armor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, yeah, we jumped on top of them, and then we just flew back. And, you know, mm-hmm. the whole time back, we're still getting shot at and all that kind of stuff. But um, wow. uh, I call it my uh, 30 seconds over Kosovo. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, the mission was like a minute, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the firefight was like thirty. So seconds. it was relatively smooth pickup. It we yeah. yeah. Besides, I mean, getting getting it, knocked it, on it the was, door a couple times. It was times. the hairiest pickup since Vietnam, but yeah. it was still relatively. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so no one, O'Grady was cakewalk. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dave Zelko, who's the stealth pilot that got shot down, hmm. I was on that mission as well. That was no shots fired, easy pickup. Hmm. Yeah, General Goldfin was the hairiest. Uh, yeah, yeah. hairiest since Vietnam. Yeah. Wow. But, I mean, you know, we got back and, you know, there was like five holes in the helicopter, you know. <laughs> it's we, always fun to come back and find those. Yeah, like, yeah. Right next to your and face. And one of, like, seriously, one of them was like literally like yeah. six inches from where I was sitting. Yeah, like right next to your face. Like, well, oh, I think well. <laughs> I, I, I think I sat down with some math guy and he figured out 
six four billionths of a second earlier, that would have gone right through my skull. You know? <laughs> so. That's uh, good food for thought. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. That's right. It's all God's stuff, man. Yeah. yeah, too much time to think if you're looking so, at that. So he's, uh, he's un- uninjured? Correct. And yeah. what's his response when he gets back? So uh, it was pretty quick. Right. So again, um, we were still dodging bullets mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff getting back. So we're, you know, he didn't have a chance to say much. Mm-hmm. Um, we got him back into Bosnia, whose handshakes, he's on a plane, he's off to go back. That's mm-hmm. hilarious. It's just like, not, not, a, thanks, bro. Yeah. <laughs> just See, 24 off. hours later, he was flying combat missions again. And the only reason he didn't fly that night was, um, they had to redo because he lost his helmet and all his oh, life yeah. support gear. So they had to re- rebuild his life support gear. And that's the only reason he didn't fly that night. He flew 24 hours after getting shot down. That's insane. That's And badass. so honestly, I had no contact with him for almost a year. And then the government accountability office uh, wanted a review of the mission. Hmm. And that's kind of where we reconnected. And we've been reconnected ever since. I mean, he lives right up in Bernie. Yeah. I Yeah. I mean, I have lunch with him like once a month. Mm-hmm. You know, um, hopefully yeah. he'll be here with you guys soon. Yeah. I think we'll be recording uh, in October. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, you know, his version of the story is a whole lot more comical than mine. You know, um, he's got a great way of telling it. Um. But the, the, the really important thing to me about the whole thing was, you know, I spent 30 seconds, a minute, mm-hmm. risking my life to save him. This guy has saved my life so many times since. Mm-hmm. He's just been there for me whenever, I, you know. Mm-hmm. Had some pretty pivotal times in your life, too. Without a doubt. You know, when I was at the Air Force Academy, um, they were going to boot me, mm-hmm. you know. Um the chief's group was like, you know, we, we, we just need you to go upon your way. You know, I was struggling with PTS. And, um, what year was this? Uh, academic year 12, 13. So, I don't know, October of 12 to maybe May of 13, mm-hmm. that time frame. Okay. And, you know, I, I mean, I was, uh, I was struggling with a really, really troubled marriage and PTSD. Mm-hmm. And I'm not an operator anymore. I'm like babysitting college kids. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the you know the combination didn't work well for me. And um, so chief groups like, hey, we just want you to kind of retire. Just you know. And General Goldfein at the time he was the vice chief of staff of the Air Force. Mm-hmm. And he made a phone call. I was like, nope, we're bringing Jeremy back to Herbert Field. We're putting him back in in Air Force Special Ops Command headquarters. Mm. And he'll retire when he's ready to retire. Wow. Put you back in your home. Yeah, yeah. did. We're, you know, we're, we're back in my tribe. Back yeah. Where, where, you know, I was comfortable. Is that what you needed at the time? I did, man. Yeah. More than anything in the world, that's exactly what I needed. Mm-hmm. I just got back home to my guys and, you know, able to freaking go work out and, uh, you know, work out with the young PJs. Yeah. And, we can hang out with the old PJs and, and, and controllers and, and, um, and I knew, you know, I knew it was time. I mean, you know, it took me a year after that to, hey, it's time to retire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I got to do it on my terms. And the only yeah. reason I got to do it on my terms was General Goldfin. That is interesting that it just came back full circle. It did. It really did. Well, it didn't stop there either, though, right? No, it didn't. Um, so you retired we, after that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, when, actually, when General Goldfin was uh, approved by Congress to be the chief of staff, mm. He and I were guest speakers at a um, a um, caregivers conference, right? right. And um, and you know we're talking, and he, he's like, "I, I got to take this call. I'll be right back." And he comes back, and I can't remember the um, Secretary of Defense um, at the time, Carter. Mm-hmm. Was it? But a- anyways, yeah, I'm not sure. He's like, I'm on the phone. What I was I was still in, so I didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Uh, he's like, hey, Jeremy, I'm going to take this call. It's the Secretary of Defense. I'm like, all right, whatever. And he comes back. He's like, hey, I just made chief. I'm like, all right, that's cool. So I got that's to, cool. so uh, Ash Carter. Yeah. Okay. Ash oh, Carter. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, 
So one of the things I think that one of my little prouder moments is Ash Carter was on, you know, CNN, CSNBC, whatever, all the the networks Mm -hmm. announcing General Goldfein's, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, being the new chief. And he's like, yeah, and he was, you know, he was standing next to the guy who rescued him, Chief Master Sergeant Jeremy Hurd. I'm like, hey, I just got a freaking call out from the Secretary <laughs> yeah. of Defense, man. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Okay. You know, so. That's pretty good. It is what it is. Yeah, but. yeah. Small wins. Right. So um, so your t- retirement, um, you, you decided to retire on your own terms. Correct. And you were still struggling, obviously. Correct. And how did that turn out for you? How was your transition out of the military? Mm-hmm. Obviously, it goes from 100 to zero really quick. Mm-hmm. You lose your sense of tribe. You lose your sense of purpose a little bit. Yeah. Where did you find yourself at? You know, I, I still say to this day, the worst thing that ever happened to me was retirement. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I agree. I, I vividly remember the day I was medically retired out of the military. It felt The best way to, I describe it is the scene from Forrest Gump when he's playing ping pong. Yeah. And they give him the letter and he just runs out the door. Right. <laughs> right. You know, it's like there's there was virtually no accountability anymore. And that yeah. that felt like abandonment. Yeah. Like it really did. I was just like, no one's gonna check on me any on Monday anymore. And that was hard for me. Yeah. No, I get that. Um it was devastating. Mm-hmm. It was. Um, you know, when I retired in 2015, I was the highest ranking airman in special warfare. And three years later, I was homeless living in a tent. Mm -hmm. Literally down by the river. (laughs) I mean, yeah. um, And and what led up to that? You know, a number of things. Once was a loss of tribe, loss of community, the divorce. Mm -hmm. I mean, I lost everything in the divorce. Um, I was in a um, brain injury clinic for a long time. And Mm -hmm. while I was there, you know, my wife divorced me and, and whatever. And so I didn't have a legal say because I was in the hospital. I didn't know I was getting divorced, all that kind of stuff. Whatever. That's a long story. It's, it's not relevant. But the bottom line was uh, I came out the backside of that stay not having anything. Mm. And so what am I going to do? Yeah. And um, I went to a freaking REI and I bought a tent. And I hitchhiked until I found the first campground I could find. And... um. You know, I just lived there for a while and, um, oh. well, like six months. And, uh, you know, to this day, I've never asked General Goldfein how he found me. The guy's a freaking retired four star chief of staff. I mean, <laughs> he's got his means. <laughs> yeah. But I was off the grid mm-hmm. and he found me. And I woke up one morning and uh, crawled out of my tent. And there's my best friend with his pickup. He's like, get your shit put it in the back of my truck. You're coming to Texas. Wow. Hmm. I'm like, how'd you find me? He's like, General Goldfein told me where you were. Just get your shit, get in the back of my truck, and let's go. And so, you know, it's kind of been... I, I'm curious. Did you have a cell phone or like... I mean, I had a cell phone. Okay, yeah. that's it. But, okay. I, but I wasn't talking to anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like... I was I wasn't answering my phone. I yeah. wasn't on okay. Facebook. I you know I was off the ground. I, I just want to be sure, yeah. like you know. <laughs> yeah, I was in, I yeah. was embarrassed about being homeless. I yeah. wasn't talking. Yeah, of course. Sure. Yeah, you know. Um, so so pack your shit. You're off to Texas, and uh, here I am. And yeah, and, and, so. and ha- like that embarrassment. Did it? F- I'm sure it felt like reporting a General Goldfein at that point. You, you know, but he is such a unique individual. Mm. Like. As embarrassed, and I, you know, I still am. There's still a level of embarrassment there, but man, I never felt embarrassed around him. Mm-hmm. I just knew that he just cared. He just, he gave a shit. Mm-hmm. He was just looking out for a bro. Mm. That's insane. Yeah. That is insane. I mean, that's uh, a crazy story. Uh, yeah. And it, I, I mean, that's like a movie. God, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. So that I was like telling you that country singer Donovan Chapman wrote a whole song about it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Well, it deserves a song. That's yeah. <laughs> it's it's a beautiful story that that covers you know the better part of twenty plus years where you had an opportunity to save his life and he returned the favor years uh, later, many times over. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. it's it's a, an amazing story. Yeah, him and him and Miss Dawn, are uh, his wife Dawn, mm-hmm. their high school like his story is way more interesting than mine. 
Well, but, I don't think you should compare your yourself to others. You have guy, a like, very took, interesting story yourself. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I guess, but you know, I mean, this guy like took a year off to bicycle around yeah. America. I know people that are yeah. Starbucks baristas for twenty years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's that's you have an interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> A little uh, bit more interesting than barista. Yeah, I don't know. Man. I don't know. It depends I've, on the I've, roast. I've met some very attractive, <laughs> very attractive baristas. Ah, uh, oh, god, you know. this guy <laughs> <laughs> troublemaker. Uh, no, that is that is a story of of overcoming adversity to its heart. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that while you were homeless, you had a lot of time to reflect. That's uh, kind of all I did. I'm sure. And I f- just fished and reflected. And how, like, I mean, was this spiraling? Is this out of control? Was there alcoholism mm-hmm. involved? There was definitely alcohol abuse involved, okay. not alcoholism. Mm-hmm. Um, I was definitely the uh, self-medicating, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Just trying to numb the, the whole idea that, you know, I went from where I was to where I am. A um, lot of self-reflection. Um, but I, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, that self-reflection wasn't as valued, uh, because I was drunk all the time. Mm-hmm. Like it, it wasn't a true, yeah. you know, the self-reflection that I've done since then mm-hmm. has been super powerful. Sure. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause it's clear headed and it's not encumbered by, you know, a substance, but, um, so it took that hand up from Goldfein yeah, to yeah. kind of shake you out of this. And was it conversations with him over time that helped you decide where you wanted your path to go? Not with him, no. A lot of conversations with myself. Mm. Okay, so so he kickstarted it, and that was that was the initiation you needed to make a change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was. And and how did those conversations go in your head? How did you? I go, to, I, go from broken to I'm going to serve others. Yeah. Um, so first of all, it was uh, really kind of punching my, you know, part of my language, but punching myself in the dick mm-hmm. and going, quit feeling sorry for yourself. Yeah. Shit happens. Get the F over it. Let's do something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's make a, let's make a difference. And so I go back to what I was saying before about, you know, being a PA or a nurse practitioner. I'm like, you know, I mean, is that, and, and I, you know, it, it wasn't my calling and, and. You know, I have, um, you know, I had a bachelor's in psychology. I liked it. I'm like, why don't I just go back to school and see if I can become a therapist Mm. just for veterans? Like, I incorporated the first responders after the fact, but like, you know, I, you know, and so got my (laughs) master's in psychology from Liberty University. And um, I did my internship at Transformations in Delray Beach, Florida. And I started seeing veterans. Mm. And the stories are so similar, then I added first responders. Had a couple of uncomfortable moments with some female clients, so I only see men clients. Mm. Um, Because I'm not about to lose my license because somebody wants to hit on me during a session. (laughs) You know, that kind of stuff, you know. It happens. It happens a lot more than you think. Well, no, it does happen. And I just don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Um, and that's so, a very common thing, actually. Yeah, it is. And it's, you know, cross transference, you know, they, they get attracted, you know, yeah. to somebody who's helping them, or whatever. They're Someone who's communicating with them, which yeah. is hard, uh, hard to find in the real world. Right. Some right. of the time. So that's how it kind of landed on that. Now I'm, uh, I'm a doctoral candidate. Uh, I'm getting my, uh, doctor of psychology. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I plan on starting a, um, uh, buy some acreage place I'm gonna call the farm. Mm-hmm. So a mental health retreat, mm, amazing for veterans and first responders. Come out there, feed the chickens, feed the goats, plant some corn, work out in the outdoor gym, do yeah. talk therapy. Love just, it. You know, it's amazing. A full something retreat center. non-standard. Like nobody wants to sit in a freaking office and no. talk about your feelings for 50 yeah. minutes once yeah. a week. Yeah, you know, Agreed. get out there and freaking live. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, when's this happening? It's a 10-year plan. 10-year plan yeah, after so, your doctorate's complete. So I'll be done with my doctorate in about three years. Okay. If if you know if my dissertation goes well. Because mm-hmm. I'm doing my dissertation on the use of uh, psychedelic medicine in uh, mental health, which uh, doesn't go over very well with 
um, mainstream psychology. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, uh, that's an interesting subject that we talk about quite substantially yeah. and, you know, there, there is lots of universities out there that are doing the research behind it. So, you know, getting yourself connected with some of these people who have a prevalent voice in that community uh, definitely gives you merit and def- definitely gives you clout. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. And, you know, I got a little bit of practice too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It saved my life. I, like it literally does. You know, I don't want to get into the specifics of it, but I had a mission in uh, 2007 that went horribly wrong. And um, I ended up um, overdosing a friend. Mm. He, 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 was, he wasn't going to live. You know, he'd lost three limbs. He was burned over 60% of his body. He wasn't going to live. And um, I made the choice and I overdosed on my morphine. Mm-hmm. Mm. So he didn't have to die in pain. And I struggled with that every day, every night since 2007. Yeah. All the way till 2018. Well, you know, as someone who's lost one limb, you know, broken back, several injuries, and you know, kind of gone that route, I, I could say that uh, that that's a tricky way to live, man. You yeah. know, uh, that's no way to live. So, in my opinion, if that was me, you, you made the right call. Yeah, it was, but 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 it was obviously still something. It was a burden that I had to carry for uh, a yeah, lot of years. Of course, and, you're, and you, I mean, you always will have that yeah. and then, question mark in the back of your head, you know. Well, I, I did for a long time, and then uh, you know, I met, um, well, not met, uh, a friend of mine um, had a nonprofit uh, that was sponsoring veterans into an ayahuasca retreat in mm-hmm. Orlando, Florida, and so I tried my hand at ayahuasca and. The very first time he came to me in a vision, he's like, bro, I would have done the same thing to you. Mm-hmm. Wow. Quit beating yourself up. You're cool, man. I'm cool. And it was, and you know, like he kind of drifted off into the ether. And, you know, I don't, I mean, it wasn't real, but it was enough in my mind. It was real enough in my mind to mm-hmm. allow me to release that guilt mm-hmm. and just get on with my life. Beautiful. Wow. You know? Beautiful. Yeah. That, that's a testament to the plant medicine right there. It I mean, is, without a doubt. Something you carried for over 11 years, you know, over a decade. Yeah. It was, it was rough, man. It was like I, I hated myself mm-hmm. for those 10, 11 years. I hated myself. Ugh. Thought I killed him. I didn't. I, did, I mean, I did what, what needed to be done. Yeah. And You showed him mercy. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, uh you know, the cool thing about ayahuasca, so, you know, the active ingredient in, in ayahuasca is dimethyltryptamine, mm-hmm. right? DMT, which is produced by the human brain. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And it gives us a step closer towards divinity, right? Just mm-hmm. allows us to make take to take one step further towards the divine. Yeah. Enough that we can commune, mm-hmm. right? And uh, that commune with the divine, like, I saw him. He's like, freaking get over it, bro. Like I was, I, you know, you know, I was expecting, to, you know, feel him pat me on the ass, go, good game. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was yeah. just that kind of, you know, close. But mm-hmm. yeah, incredible story. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Well, I, I, I just have to say, your resiliency is is something to be commended. I mean, I appreciate that. Admirable for sure. It's and the not path, me though, man. It's my faith. It's your faith. It's the people around you. I mean, it is. Uh, Goldfein being there for you yeah. as well uh, is incredible, and we're excited to have him uh, and his side of the story too. Uh, but job well done, man! Getting out of the tent, and <laughs> now you're getting your doctorates, and and going to help countless people, countless people. So I hope so. Really, really amazing. Yeah, I appreciate that. If you had uh, one thing for the audience before we wrap up today, do you have uh, one thing you want to let them know or? Wow. About resiliency or medicine or anything. Yeah, man. I mean. Touch wisdom. Yeah, I'm not a very wise guy. So I mean, I would say that the name of this episode is Don't Give Up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just keep pressing. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, always that, man. Always. Yeah. Like, you know, um, real quick, and I'll make it a quick story, but um, in 2017, I was, uh, was going to suck start my clock. Mm-hmm. I was done. Yeah. You know, my wife left me. Everything was over, you know. And uh, my service dog jumped in my lap and bit 
the pistol out of my hand. Now, he had no training to do any of that. That's all God right there. Wow. Mm. Right. I mean, that's all spiritual. Right. And so I'm like, all right, well, you know, can't do that. Right. Yeah. And so then I did what you what both of you said. I was just like, all right, well, I tried to quit. Apparently, I'm, I'm not allowed to quit. <laughs> it didn't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you just got to freaking press, man. And mm-hmm. you, But you have to find... Um, you have to find your... Um, you have to find what makes you happy, what, what will keep you happy. And, and even if it's just what's going to keep me happy today, mm-hmm. right, to mm-hmm. get you through today. Yeah. And when you, you know... A day at a time, and I know that's a big A thing, take one day at a time, whatever. But um, when you do, when you take life one second at a time, mm-hmm. you're going to look back and, and you're going to be past it all. Mm. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it's never worth giving up. It's never worth quitting. Mm. Yeah, and a lot of, there's a lot, lot of people that, that do take the shortcut. You know, and uh, that's unfortunate. We see quite a bit, but you know that that is a very good point that you make. Is is one foot in front of the other? Mm-hmm. You know, take it moment by moment if you really need to. Um, and most of the time, I'm sure you get asked the question is like, how, how do you get through that? You know, mm-hmm. and you just like ah, day by day, day by day. And it's yeah. and it's it seems so flippant to just say that. Mm-hmm. But when you actually live it mm-hmm. and then look back, yeah. I mean, you understand the days profound, accumulate. Yeah, right? it's, it's the paperclip that. theory, right? Right. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks again for sharing today. We yeah. loved having you on the show, and I'm sure that our audience is definitely going to get something out of this today. So, uh, appreciate you and your service, man. Thank you. And uh, looking looking forward to seeing this go live. Yeah. Thanks a lot for joining us, yeah, Jeremy. David, uh, Christian, I really appreciate you guys having me on. Of it's, course. Uh, amazing. Of course, man. We'll have you back on sometime soon, too. Sure. Absolutely. I, I, Anytime. I can't, I can't wait. Excellent. This has been the Medivac Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, listening today. Remember to interact with the video. Share this with a friend. Comment, like, do all the things. Uh, let's get some engagement up. Thank you for listening. Bye. Until next time.